Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger, uh, as many of you know, a blockchain initiative hosted at the Linux Foundation. And we've been at this as a project for almost five years. Our fifth birthday is coming up on December 17th. And we thought to commemorate that we would put together a series of panels uh, looking at Really, how much progress have we made uh, uh, in uh, going out there and talking about enterprise blockchain, building tools uh, that enterprises can use, and really supporting the deployment of this really exciting domain? Um, uh, and and we're really pleased to have uh, put together a, uh, this series of panels covering a, a range of different topics. Uh, in fact, the one next week is in a different time zone. It's focused on the the Asia Pacific audience. We felt it was important to as we have for our history to, to really uh, make sure that that uh, part of the world feels uh, and is included as a first class participant. Uh, so look forward to that. In fact, on the Hyperledger website, we've published the agenda for those upcoming events. They uh, all happen roughly this same time, uh, uh, each of the next weeks, uh, uh, and then culminating on December 17th with a networking reception that we're putting together, uh, which is the actual birthday, just to kind of celebrate and, and, uh, and, and get to know each each other better and that sort of thing. So um, all of these talks uh, are being recorded and will be put up on YouTube uh, for uh, uh, for you to watch later. Um, but we will be taking questions, live questions uh, at the end of this session. So be thinking about what you want to ask and, 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 and potentially put forward. Uh, we also have a shirt uh, available. Uh, uh, you have to pay the shipping, but the shirt itself is free. So to help us celebrate uh, uh, all of that, again, it'll be available at the uh, five-year anniversary website, uh, which the link to which will drop in chat here if we haven't already. Um, uh, and um, and go ahead and, and pick that up. That'll be ready actually uh, later today or this week, I think uh, the link will be available to be able to order that. Um, now I'd like to hand the reins off to uh, Hanna Zupko, who's the co-founder and CEO of Intellect EU. She will be moderating the panel today uh, and facilitating the introductions of the other panelists. So with that, uh, I will pass the baton and uh, take it away, Hanna. Oh, Hannah, you're on mute. Thank you, Brian. Um, I feel really honored to uh, moderate today this all-star enterprise blockchain panel collecting and bringing together all the heavyweights and people who's been there from the very beginning. So let me start with introduction, uh, Chris Ferris. IBM Fellow, CTO, um, Open Technology at IBM, and also Hyperledger board member. And um, also I know Chris as a person, the person leading technical steering committee for from very, very early days of Hyperledger. And um, here with us also, uh, Dana Prey, uh, who is a chief strategy officer at Digital Assets and um, also the original founder of uh, Hyperledger Startup uh, before it was contributed uh, to Linux Foundation. Uh, I'll let uh, Dan later speak about origins of the name. And um, uh, David Treat, uh, who is Global Blockchain and Multi-Party Systems Lead at Accenture and uh, Hyperledger board member. Um, so thank you everyone making time for uh, the panel today. And uh, to kick off, I really would love uh, all of you to reflect on what was the state of blockchain at the time when Hyperledger was um, created in 2015. Where were you at that time? Uh, what inspired your respective organizations to join this open source initiative uh, to advance blockchain technology? Um, who would like to start? I, <clears throat> this is Chris, I, I can start. Um, so uh, I think I'm to blame part, part for why we're all here. Um, I, or actually, I guess I should say Jerry Cuomo is to blame. Um, I was, uh, I, in my role as CTO for Open Tech, uh, oftentimes people in IBM that are working on, you know, projects that they think they want to open source come to me and ask me for guidance about how they should do it. And, uh, <clears throat> We had been uh, doing some research, some research and sort of advanced development on enterprise blockchain for, uh, I want to say about six months, maybe since the summer of uh, 2015. And, um, and, and 
Jerry felt very strongly that we should consider whether or not we should open source this effort since much of the blockchain that was out there, Bitcoin and Ethereum were already open source. Um, and, um, and so I suggested that we in fact do that and but that we also look to bring the project under open governance um, and not have it be exclusively controlled by IBM. And so uh, I actually uh, put together a proposal and called my friend Jim Zemlin, the executive director of the Linux Foundation and, and pitched him the idea of creating a um, a project under the, the Linux Foundation to develop enterprise blockchain technology. Um, and uh, so I, I pitched him and, and there was a moment of silence and then he just started laughing. And I was like, Jim, I don't, I don't get it. Why are you laughing at me? I thought it was a pretty good proposal. And he says, no, I'm not laughing at you. He says, I'm laughing because you're not the first person to come and pitch me an idea for a blockchain based project at the Linux Foundation. And he says, you're about the eighth. and. Uh, <laughs> he says, but you're the first one that actually made one that made sense for a Linux Foundation. And so that sort of, you know, sealed the deal. And, uh, you know, we collaboratively worked to, to pull together the initial set of companies and, uh, and uh, make the announcement on the, on the 17th uh, with, uh, so I, I had a lot of help, I'll be honest. I mean, I had John Wolpart, who is no longer with IBM, he's now with Consensus, but he did a lot of the, the, the dialing of dollars for you know, calling up his his the people on his on his Rolodex, you know, to ask them if they wanted to participate, and uh, <clears throat> and Jim obviously has a very rich Rolodex. We actually uh, we we over you know we we uh, we far exceeded what I was hoping we would get initially. I think we had seventeen uh, companies on the initial announcement in the seventeenth, and then when we formally launched the organization in February, I think we had twenty two and. It went from there, and it just it just blew up. So so that's basically you know where where it was. I mean, blockchain wasn't really exciting then. It really was the I think the the uh, the holiday season of 2015 2016 that every CTO or a CIO in the in the world you know was going to holiday parties and hearing about blockchain and ICOs and how you know everything and and they came back you know the beginning of the year and blockchain 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 we have to do blockchain and so I think it was very. Uh, very timely that, you know, the, the start of uh, Hyperledger. Um, Dan, what are your memories? So, hi everyone, Dan O'Bray from Digital Asset. Uh, so I'm, uh, as Hannah mentioned, I'm to blame for the name and you can blame Chris for everything else. So I'll uh, <laughs> get the credit just for that piece. Um, my, my personal sort of journey with blockchain started uh, around 2013. I just left my, my previous cloud startup uh, and then was getting very interested in Bitcoin. And obviously that was the, the, the hot thing. Ethereum hadn't quite launched yet around then. Um, and just started really exploring how the tech could be used outside of just purely for a cryptocurrency and had absolutely no idea where the market would go or what it would be called. And myself and my co-founder were just sort of throwing around a couple of names. And uh, actually it was he who suggested Hyperledger. So I can't even take credit for that piece. Uh, and I thought at the time it sounded a bit 80s and retro and uh, a bit dated, uh, but fortunately he convinced me that retro was going to be cool again. So we went with it and it stuck. Um, and then, yeah, the, the technology really around 2015 when we started Hyperledger uh, at the Linux Foundation, uh, there was just Bitcoin, there was Ethereum, it was still all very much public chain focused, but the roots and the core of of what is now known as the enterprise blockchain space uh, were starting to emerge, as Chris mentioned, the uh, sort of six month development of what was then open blockchain before, before Fabric, as well as some other initiatives. And really what drew us a digital asset who, who uh, we, had, we had joined previously to, towards starting this is, is you know, continuing the conversation with IBM, with the Linux Foundation, uh, around a, a bunch of companies where collectively really our business model wasn't to build and sell a blockchain itself. It was either to sell cloud services around it or systems integrations or build applications on top of it. Uh, and we were fortunate to have a, a large customer at the time with the Australian Securities Exchange. And we were you know, building the blockchain, the smart contract language, the smart contracts themselves, the application on top of that. Uh, and really everyone was sort of having to do by necessity the end to end. Uh, we saw really the, the opportunity there for uh, a group of companies which weren't 
you know, weren't directly trying to monetize uh, that layer to actually just come together and collaborate and make sure uh, that's something that met the needs of of the use cases we'll talk about later today uh, existed uh, so that we could all uh, focus and specialize building on top and around that. So uh, did not expect, you know, five years after we started the project, you know, as Chris said, it, it, the initial interest was, was surprising and then the amount it grew uh, after that was, was also incredible to see. And then, then the projects that are alive in production today uh, in just five years for such a core infrastructural technology is, is incredible. Yeah, I, I recall meeting you then at the startup pitch competition, and here we are five years later, or even more, right, than five years uh, from the original time uh, when the Hyperledger was just a small startup to now being hosted at Linux Foundation. So David, um, now uh, I'm turning to you to hear about Accenture journey and uh, why have you guys decided that it made sense for you to join this initiative? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll end up crediting both um, both DA and IBM in some of the, in some of the early engagement. We had, um, we, you know, we had uh, we've got Accenture Labs, right? Our applied R and D function, and they had they had been working on uh, blockchain since you know around two, 2012 ish timeframe. Uh, Giuseppe Giordano and Luca and uh, you know whole whole team in that in that lab. And and you know what we do is is the moment that we're seeing enough client engagement and success and the actual use cases and value cases, um, we, we mature that mature it out of the lab's infrastructure and start to build a business around it. And um, just, you know, just maybe, I don't know, six or eight months before, um, before uh, Hyperledger was formed, we had come to that conclusion that it was time to start to build, you know, build this business. Um, and so as part of that, those early days, uh, you know, we, we, did did two obvious things, right? We reached out to we have you know our massive alliance partnership with IBM and and you know our our great history of going to market together from a product perspective, and then as our you know we survey the startup community, um, you know digital asset actually uh, had gone through the fintech innovation lab program that uh, um, that we co-sponsor and I now co-run in New York, um, and uh, I think it was Blythe and Yuval pulled me aside at one point and say hey um, this you know this hyperledger thing is forming you should pay attention. Um, and you know, moments later, uh, you know, connecting all the dots, it was it was an obvious join given where we were in that stage of of evolution. And so we're thrilled to jump in right from the start and to you know do what we could to, to help to shape it. And so um, you know, at that point in time, I think you know both Chris and Dan said it well. It was it was definitely early days. Um, we were on for you know first clients, first uh, first clients, first implementations, first use cases. Um, we had the confidence that we knew that this was going to be important and that we needed to build a business around it. Um, but, but clearly, uh, you know, hindsight is 2020, um, you know, we, it, um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's been a wild journey, um, since then, um, predictable in some ways and, and very unpredictable in others. So, um, we, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it uh, no regrets move from the start. We're eager, um, just from a philosophical basis, to seek out, given the implicit nature of what this technology is about, of being able to form, you know, multi-party systems with others and rethink and transform entire industries, not bringing a single thing to a single client, but thinking about how to engage the entire front-to-back business flow and ecosystem. You know, how else are you going to do that? But to come together in, in a group of consor you know, consortia of, of clients, peers, you know, you know, et cetera, to, to really think through how the technology can support that dynamic. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, an, an obvious join, a no regrets move, and it's been a, it's been a wild ride since. Um, great. So reflecting on the journey, um, I, um, I was curious to hear your thoughts on how, um, how did we and what we learned from just starting from one project, Hyperledger Fabric, and going now to 16 projects under the same umbrella, or if I use Hyperledger terms, within the same greenhouse. Uh, so what did we learn? Um, what, uh, what other opportunities and challenges in having um, so many different code bases? Um, Chris, I'll uh, hand so it's actually, I mean, it's, it's 16 plus uh, close to 40. I think there's like 38 uh, Hyperledger Labs projects. And, uh, you know, Lori knows how many projects there are outside of Hyperledger that are 
um, basing them uh, that, that are based on, on hyperledger technology. Um, <clears throat> so it, it was an interesting ride. I think, you know, when I had originally sort of, you know, proposed it, I was thinking it would be one project with a lot of sort of satellite or, you know, attendant projects, kind of like an OpenStack kind of a thing, right? Where there's one core and a lot of experimentation and so forth at the edges. Um, uh, and then uh, Intel proposed Sawtooth, like within a week or two of the, the Fabric uh, proposal. And now we had two and, and we actually uh, then had, a, I think, a third from uh, Digital Assets, right? Um, uh, where uh, they were proposing their API. And so we started out sort of thinking about, well, how do we bring these things together? How do we, how do we sort of glue them together and make, you know, um, uh, you know, make uh, something that's a little bit better than, you know, the sum of its parts. Um, and, and that's how things started out, but then it just kept accreting. There was more projects came in over time and, uh, you know, because the, the community was pretty vibrant. It still is very, very vibrant. Uh, and, uh, and it was sort of the place to be for uh, enterprise blockchain technology. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, I think we have sort of two flavors of things going on. I think we have a lot of things that are built around some sort of center of gravity. And, uh, and then we have multiple centers of gravity, right? Where you have Fabric and now Besu and, uh, and Sawtooth and Indy. Uh, and we have now a bunch of projects that are sort of pulling out and teasing out components. So projects like Ursa um, are, uh, you know, focusing on, so here's a common set of functionality that we can share across a number of different projects. Projects like Grid, Transact, again, same sort of idea where we could have something that was built that could potentially be, be used by many. Um, you have projects like Cello and, and Caliper that were designed to be used by all as, you know, whether it's a deployment framework or a benchmarking framework. Um, and, and now you have uh, projects like Cactus that are, that are looking at interoperability between blockchain. So um, <clears throat> again, I think we have these multiple centers of gravity and then we have some of these things that are sort of in the interstices of, you know, between the projects or that are trying to glue the projects together. Um, and so it, it is an interesting ride. You know, I, I don't know that there's, uh, you know, a correct or an incorrect approach to how things are, are going, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we are where we are and it's, it, it seems to be moving along pretty well. So, you know, I'll, e even during this, this, you know, 2020, the year <laughs> that we're all trying to forget, <laughs> um, I think it's actually been, been going quite well. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting ride. We're, we're definitely coming up with a whole lot of innovation and that's, I think, a positive. Um, and uh, so I hope we can keep it up and, and maybe you know get to fewer centers of gravity so that we're collaborating a little bit more across across the uh, the different boundaries that that piece of it chris i mean that that's always you know i don't know it's been what every every six or nine months and maybe we let's get brian away in here right through every six or nine months right we have a, a decently heated but always collegial and productive conversation of, of right that is it is it do we you know is it a cambrian explosion of projects and you know right. and or or do we start to rally and and, and consolidate and um you know, it's certainly an ongoing, ongoing discussion topic, you know, um, but, it, you know, certainly with some facets of it, we've seen that specialization, right? The use, the yeah. use case demanding a certain, you know, a, you know, a specific set of capabilities, you know, and, you know, what India has done around the digital identity space and, you know, give way to, you know, Aries over time and, and you know, the integration between the two, um, you know, versus Fabric versus Soft2 versus, versus Base2. I think it's, you know, it's, it's one of the more fun and productive, you know, conversations every six to nine months and, and I know it, it um, you know Brian has to play referee sometimes but um, <laughs> I don't know Brian do you well you know if, if we if we put you on the spot and said you know which, which, which direction is going right now <laughs> what would you say uh, well I, I think it's all it's worth reminding kind of the audiences so I, I, I my own kind of journey into to, to hyperledger actually I'm a latecomer after all
all of these guys and, I, and, and after Hannah as well, um, I came in, I, I, I saw the announcement in December, uh, but it wasn't until uh, May or June, I forget the exact start date, um, that I pulled the trigger and, and joined as a full-time employee of the Linux Foundation and full-time focused on Hyperledger. And one of the things I realized, and actually I'd been to some of the community meetings, um, the one that was at JP Morgan's offices in Brooklyn, I think, yeah. and another one in DTCC uh, in Jersey City or something like that. Um, one thing I realized was here are a lot of really smart people uh, trying to learn what 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 actually is happening of value out in the, the cryptocurrency world that could be brought into the, the the blockchain space and what should maybe we distance ourselves from things like proof of work right um, but what also was pretty clear was that in any room of like this one like like any room of smart people you're going to have a lot of diversion opinions on the right way to for you know for consensus mechanisms to work the right way for um, I think there's even a very fundamental difference between fabrics uh, notion of what is that uh, execute and then con uh, converge um, versus I, 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 the Ethereum or other blockchain networks where it's like uh, execute distributed and then I, I, it, and basically there's a very fundamental difference between the two. I'm sorry, Chris, you'll get it much better than I can. Um, and that was actually reflected in the differences between Sawtooth and uh, Fabric, which were both alive when I showed up on the scene. Um, and even down to the implementation languages. I mean, I always hate it when um, debates in software become as banal as programming language preferences, right? But um, but they do matter. Um, it mattered that Go was in fa that Fabric was in Go and that uh, Sawtooth was in Python um, because they had different objectives uh, and different goals. Yeah. And so it was, you know, finding a way to build a Frankensteinian combination of all these things wasn't going to work in the short term. And it really meant that we had to figure out for the long term was Hyperledger going to be about kind of like the Linux kernel project, right? There's a lot to be said for an intense focus on one common skeleton, one common frame that everything else hangs off of. Um, or <clears throat> should we uh, should we be a umbrella or what we eventually started to call the greenhouse um, uh, of a couple of different ideas and kind of let the market decide, so to speak, the market being both the consumers as well as the developers and others. Um, and I didn't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I felt that there were reasons to do either. Um, and But I put it out to our community. I put it out to, to the, the public facing side as well as our membership. Uh, the, uh, and, and I remember hearing pretty clearly people wanted optionality people wanted to take the pressure off of the fabric team to have to be all things to all people, right? Uh, uh, and and make sure that, you know, even if we had a little bit of confusion to deal with, we had a better shot at making sure we had the category leading uh, platforms in. And I think we we over exceeded on that goal. We had not just one with fabric, which, you know, uh, do credit to everybody who's been involved with that, Chris, yourself and, and, <clears throat> and everybody, um, that is now the majority deployed platform out there in the enterprise blockchain space, right? Um, but we also have now the, the, the category leading digital identity, distributed digital identity platform in the form of Indian Aries uh, and the drive that that's made. Uh, and um, what we all hope will be the category leading uh, uh, Ethereum client out there, um, especially as it gets you know, uh, uh, combined and, and integrated uh, uh, with, I'm not sure what the right word will be because we're still waiting to find out, but with uh, the quorum code base. Um, and that's a great place to be in <clears throat> and, and to have a community that can talk about the, the ways that we can even share ideas, share infrastructure, to build cross ledger projects, you know, those sorts of things. And projects like the blockchain automation framework in Hyperledger Labs, which is due a lot of uh, attention. Um, that's a really powerful thing. And so I think that's that's really an accomplishment. It's it's hard to pull together a community of communities. Um, and I think we've done a pretty admirable job on that. Um, but there's always questions at the boundary, questions at the periphery to figure out how can we do better. Um, and Brian, uh, there is uh, live questions that came in that I think would fit in what you just shared, um, specifically like a um, uh, question from Lucian, are there any blockchain projects involving sector regulators that need to check compliance with mandatory norms, quality, safety, or technical regulations applicable to imported products? Thank you. Um, I don't know if any, any of you are comfortable. I've got, I mean, it's certainly, um... You know the the work that we're doing with Nippon Nippon Express right on fabric is you know pharma pharma you know responding to pharmaceutical serialization requirements to make sure that we've got you know you know we're not in, not allowing counterfeit drugs to enter into the you know the pharmaceutical supply chain um, heavily regulated heavily you know um, I don't know if, I don't know if that squarely fits the question you're asking but that's the first thing I jumped to in terms of a, a regulated uh, heavily regulated business process flow that has all of those checks and balances as the core use case of it, or one of the core well, use cases. 
And, and, and I'll start by answering one. Uh, within Hyperledger itself, uh, none of the code bases themselves are tightly tied to a regulatory use case or to you know require regulatory approval or anything like that. It's just software. It all depends on how it goes out there and gets deployed in different scenarios. And um, <clears throat> but I have to say, almost every project I hear about is about meeting some. I, uh, some use case, some set of needs in very heavily regulated environments, whether it's pharmaceutical supply chain, whether it's uh, insurance regulatory conformance, which is another project that is it, it, it implements it with all sorts of supply chain traceability needs, all sorts of financial instrument kinds of needs. The involvement of the regulators is pretty key to those projects to make them successful. Uh, and that's been really cool to see the regulators warming up to the under, underpinnings of the technology and getting comfortable with that and actually seeing it as, uh, you know, this technology as reg tech in a way. Um, I, I don't know if others on the, on the um, panel have kind of seen that, but I, I know all of you have operated in, in these heavily regulated industries and built projects there in that, um, including including yourselves, uh, uh, Hannah, at Intellect EU. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, Lucien asked whether um, uh, we could provide some links describing this project. Um, I guess um, Hyperledger website uh, would be a good place to start uh, to look for links. And there's also newsletters that you can sign up to learn more about all the upcoming projects, but um, I'll let Hyperledger team also to fo follow up. Um, and for everyone who is listening, I would encourage you to um, post questions uh, in the Q&A and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, so um, uh, I'd really appreciate to move now towards looking and reflecting of where we are now. So Hyperledger in 2020. Uh, this has been clearly unprecedented year, and um, um, how did um, ecosystem has changed um, since COVID-19? Uh, well, maybe um, this year has actually created some fertile ground for some projects to emerge or new opportunities to be there. Uh, so what, what are your thoughts? on uh, the current state of Hyperledger as well, like amidst uh, the pandemic? So <clears throat> it's interesting, you know, I think when, when, I, when I look back and, and think about sort of where we were in uh, December, January of this, uh, this past year, um, <clears throat> you know, I think there was a lot of expectation that we were moving out of the trough of disillusionment um, with regards to blockchain solutioning um, and moving into a domain where um, it was really more about uh, people recognizing there's value, but then having to sort of, you know, ex you know, uh, to educate people on, on, um, you know, how it could be used effectively, right? Um, and, but then we uh, got hit with the pandemic, no more travel, no more client visits, you know, everything's Zoom-based or, you know, WebEx or Meet meetups or whatever. Um, it's worth and, noting, Chris, in that moment, what all of our, what, what for many of us that last trip was, was the uh, Global Forum. It was. <laughs> well, I, I ducked out of that. I was actually a little bit afraid of going, <laughs> being as old as I am. And uh, I said, We missed no, you at the you Corona know. Ranch, Chris. <laughs> yes, Corona <laughs> Ranch was ahead. <laughs> And, um, but yeah, it really, it, it, it almost was the, I, I actually, the, the week before we were wrapping up our first meeting of the open SSF, what became open SSF, uh, the open source security forum. Um, and uh, so, but I think, you know, we were thinking, okay, we're ready to go. And now we've got some patterns that are very effective and we can start rolling these things out and everybody puts the brakes on business comes to a screeching halt and uh, and, but, you know, again, new opportunities emerged, right? And so there was an awful lot of focus on, you know, coming up with a vaccine, coming up with, you know, therapeutics and so forth. And so there was a lot of focus on uh, high performance computing and so forth. Um, but then also we had to figure out, well, how are we going to get back to work, right? You know, what's going to be the process for understanding who's been vaccinated, who hasn't been vaccinated, who's, you know, tested positive or whatever, and uh, so we have a whole new set of uh, potential opportunity for blockchain-based solutions. I think Mipasa was the first one out the door from uh, <clears throat> Acera and IBM and uh, the World Health Organization sort of getting together and coming up with uh, an approach. But you know, since then, there have been a number of different applications that are using blockchain as a, as a means of securing credentials about whether or not you've been 
uh, you know, cleared of the virus and so forth, um, uh, or even just sharing information, you know, about whether or not you can be entered into a building and, and so forth for, for going back to work. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as we come out of this in the next, you know, six, nine months or whatever, when people get vaccinated and so forth, um, I, I do think that, you know, a lot of the patterns that we had been ready to sort of unleash um, and to start really driving um, uh, supply chain management, uh, supplier management, uh, uh, trade finance, um, uh, insurance, right, some, some regulatory things, you know, identity credential based, uh, 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 I'm sorry, identity based credentialing of, you know, uh, um, uh, diplomas and so forth. Uh, an awful lot of things are starting to come together uh, as the, the year, as, as people sort of figure out how to get back to, to doing things. Uh, I just think that this year was unfortunate that we weren't actually in a very experimental phase where people are looking to do, you know, sort of non-core required things for their business because everybody is so uh, challenged in, in many other respects. But I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, spirit of innovation can return and we can start exploring even more use cases and taking those same solution domains, those sort of patterns and applying them in other, in other contexts. I think that'll, that'll be the, the next uh, year and a half or so coming. Yeah, I, I agree with Chris and I think yeah, also the opportunity piece that, that he mentioned. Um, I've been pretty pleasantly surprised, you know, sort of business wise after after, as he said, the sort of few months where everyone slammed on the brakes and were distracted and we're all trying to figure out how to work from home, et cetera. Uh, the new sort of accelerated impetus on, on generally on digitization and on digitizing their business and mod modernizing their infrastructure. Uh, we've seen, you know, unprecedented levels of sort of like trade volumes in the, in the markets uh, and need for these systems to actually scale uh, and deal with, you know, new ways of working. Uh, many of you know, our customers or you know, people within the financial services industry, insurance, et cetera, are dealing with old mainframes and 20 year old systems. So I do think a part of this has been a, a big opportunity and a refocus on, on how, you know, if we are going to modernize these systems, which are working, but brittle uh, and aging, uh, can blockchain be the thing we look to, to make sure that we are future proof for you know, the next uh, black swan event or, or unprecedented time. So we've seen yeah, elements of things slowing down and, and you know, pleasingly elements of things speeding up as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, right? We're, we're, you know, we're and, and I think the next, you know, months and quarters are going to be even more intense against some of these dimensions that Chris and Dan referenced, right? We're, we're facing the world's largest supply chain event ever, Right to get you know to get how many well you know, 7.8 billion people vaccines right on a global scale, and with with the certainty and confidentiality that they you know that they are genuine, um, you know the the you know real time distribution of areas of oversupply to undersupply the feedback loops the you know the the level of coordination between a the manu the drug manufacturers the logistics providers the health systems and the governments that all four of those industries need to collaborate with each other to be able to you know to you know to manage that that that, that flow and event um, you know those that are doing it incredibly well and right are not viewing it as a tactical one off how many you know how many can I throw brute force it you know bubblegum band aids and just get get by um, but are thinking are thinking forward to you know, the, the dynamics, right, that I think both Chris and Dan referenced that the, the changing nature of our global supply chains and that and what the, our whole wave of technology has unlocked the creativity to rethink those as not being as static and linear and opaque and, you know, and <laughs> paper based, and, um, you know, as you know, as they are. Um, I think I think we're, you know, I think we're seeing every bit of a, of a massive acceleration over the next year and some phenomenal work over the past couple of quarters particularly driven by that. And then you pull on dimensions like benefits distribution, right? With, with so many people out of work and, the, and you know, you know, <laughs> developed countries like the US government saying, okay, we're gonna rely on paper checks coming out from, you know, from uh, the IRS to get into people's hands, right? The, the, the tokenization of money, the future of money, the, the notion of digital identity wallets, right? The, you know, the, the, the reality of I'm, you know, today I hold my physical driver's license next to my millimeters away from my physical cash in the wallet in my pocket, right? 
in the digital world, I need to be, you know, I need to have that linkage between an effective self self managed digital identity on Indian Aries, um, you know, tightly coupled with my ability to hold tokenized assets, right? And th those all, that all has to hang together. And so, you know, I think we've got every bit of tailwind behind us at this point. You know, the you know pick pick your uh, pick your phrasing of you know don't don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. It's um you know. I don't mean to belittle it in any way, or I don't mean to diminish the 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 you know the the tremendous amount of suffering that's come along with this, but you know, but the you know the good that, that can arise from the motivations to be able to have more flexible supply chains to actually modernize our digital world, not just electronify it, um, and really rethink the the you know how companies and business flows and entire ecosystems can work together differently. I think it's been I think ultimately as we look back, this will be a huge boon for this wave of innovation. Thank you, David. Um, uh, another question, and I, I, I'd love to um, um, answer questions live as much as possible, so we can um, well, we can you know address um, what people are interested. And in. so there's a question from Deepak that came in about uh, job roles in Hyperledger, opportunities and the skill set. So I guess for all the developers out there and business people out there who are interested to get involved with Hyperledger, what, um, what are your thoughts on, on this topic, on the job roles in, in Hyperledger? So, I mean, Brian can speak to any potential hiring he may be doing, um, but in terms of the community, there's uh, all manner of opportunity. Um, you know, certainly the open source projects themselves are always looking for um, people to come and start, you know, contributing, whether it's fixing bugs or, you know, even just helping to spell check and grammar check the documentation. There's uh, translation opportunities because um, many of the projects are just embarking on their uh, journey to, uh, to translate their documentation into other languages. I know Hyperledger Fabric has um, a few of them, uh, but again, the more the merrier, right? The more languages that we can develop, uh, uh, that we can share with developers, the, the broader uh, the adoption can be. Um, <clears throat> uh, so there's, you know, there's that, there's um, uh, uh, sort of speaker bureau capabilities, right? So we have, you know, the marketing committee, I think manages a speaker bureau. So people that are able to get out there and do, you know, either, you know, webinars or, you know, I know there's no meetups or anything anymore, but, um, you know, I'm sure that'll come back shortly or conference uh, presentations. Um, I think the, the community is always looking for somebody to help promote uh, Hyperledger at, at these, you know, the many events. Um, and then uh, there's a, a number of working groups and, and SIGs that uh, are run by Hyperledger that are focused either on a specific industry or a specific vertical. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, there's opportunity to come and engage in those and, and sort of share ideas and thinking about uh, application of blockchain technologies in various industries. So tons and tons of opportunity, I think, to get involved. And of course, then there's always, you know, the various committees and marketing committees always looking for people to help, uh, right, Dan? So. <laughs> Well, I would interpret even this question broader in a sense that um, for sure, um, you know, not only Hyperledger as such uh, would require um, uh, hires, but also entire ecosystem of all our clients that are building with it, all of us who are helping our clients to build, you know, we are intellect to you hiring all the time and it's a uh, yeah matter whether you're a Java developer or a Go developer and you want to come and become familiar with Hyperledger technologies and build uh, the next um, transparent supply chain or you want to ensure that um, like there's going to be the next uh, central bank digital currency uh, or you know what wh whatever other use case you want to apply you can really you know transparency in a distribution of financial aid or help with um, uh, help with distribution of vaccine and ensure that there is no counterfeit vaccine. And so you can really take up, in my opinion, this skill set and uh, understanding of hyperledger technologies and apply them to really meaningful causes. Um, you know, working with all the companies that are present here uh, on this call, but uh, um, also beyond, uh, working for many of the members um, as well as just consortia that is using hyperledger technologies. And I don't know if anyone else uh, wants to do a shout out about hiring. 
Well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll throw out that um, it was only in January that LinkedIn published uh, its list of skills in highest demand based on the, the resumes that they see. And blockchain was at the top of that list. Um, uh, and I don't think much has changed due to the pandemic. I, I do think uh, just to like go back to that earlier thread, it has certainly um, made, uh, you know, slashed budgets, especially around R&D and a lot of deployment of blockchain projects from scratch do involve a leap of faith and coordinating, you know, more than one big legacy company to, to agree to pool something in common, right, which is a really hard thing to bootstrap. But the networks that have been launched, like the Food Trust Network, like Trade Lens, like the different trade finance networks that are out there, have seen some pretty remarkable growth uh, in, 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 in numbers of participants, in transactions, that sort of thing. And it's kind of like the dark matter of, of blockchain um, applications out there because they, they don't show this activity doesn't show up on a site like CoinMarketCap or whatever. It does show up in things like the Forbes Blockchain 50, which is useful to track. And you see a lot of blue chip companies talking about some pretty deep usage of it. Uh, uh, companies like Cargill and Walmart and that sort of thing, but it's really hard to measure. But one way to measure it is that that demand in the job set and so in the in the skill set. So um, that was an interesting reference point. And we've seen, as, as some folks know, we have a, a training and certification program for uh, administrators and developers on Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and uh, also a lot of training materials for Indie and Aries and, and some of the other uh, things. But the certification thing has been a pretty popular course. I, I, and uh, we're in the process of updating that for Fabric too. So it's a little behind the, the, the curve there, but, um, uh, but that's been something that's su surprising to us, uh, but in retrospect, perhaps not really is people do want to become expert in this domain. And I think it does require a, a unique set of skills in the same way that SQL databases, when they came out, required people to learn how to design their, their database tables. And there was that was as different from what came before as I think blockchain technology and designing these blockchain networks, the right way to use chain code, the right way to use other kinds of smart contracts and design the, the um, the, the 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 topology of the network um, that's that's an emerging skill set that's in in pretty high demand and certainly encourage folks to take a look at that yeah it, it, maybe if I just pile on with one more thought the the um I, I have found this particular innovate you know wave of innovation and technology or the set as being you as being you know one of the best examples where if you're a deep technologist, you're a developer, engineer, architect, needing to understand the strategic relevance of the use cases to where it applies is critically important. And conversely, if you're the business strategist, you know, uh, you know, analyst type, if you don't really understand the technology, um, you know, it, it, this is one of those ones where you know, this is one of those spaces where you really have to have that well-rounded view. And and um, and we've done, I think, the hyperledger community has done just an amazing job over the past five years of you know of really zeroing in on valuable application of the technology um, amidst some of the you know the wider community you know running around you know with uh, you know blockchain the answer what's the question right and you know and and viewing it as a panacea rather than one of you know one architecture or, or a collection of architectural patterns that address a, a core fundamental need and change of how the digital world is evolving and you know and then and you know what that means right the the meaning of getting companies re rethinking their siloed based infrastructures and architectures and message you know messaging and reconciliation based business models and and what what the what shared data infrastructures and what tokenization actually mean um, I, you know if you're thinking about how to develop a career in this space um, you know I couldn't encourage you more you know, do it in a well-rounded fashion, right? If you're a technologist and engineer at heart, really understand the strategic importance and, re and context and vice versa. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And sort of going back to the sort of looking five years ago versus where we are today. Five years ago, there was a massive chasm. There was, you know, some people could explain the technology, some people understood the business, but they would go and talk to each other in meetings and, and they were just speaking different languages uh, about how, you know, how these things work, what the business objectives are, how they're trying to achieve. So I'd say that's been closed a lot, you know, over the last five years. And now it's, now it's maybe more of a gap than a chasm, but uh, it's certainly still, uh, an area where where people you know there's always more people uh, needed uh, and being hired every day great and um, i think it's a good segue to also talk about where the skills can be applied um, in the context of some sharing some specific examples of hyperledger projects that already either um, live or went into production or soon 
to go into production. Um, maybe you could um, share some examples of projects that are, you know, you believe are going to have mainstream adoption. Um, David, I'll uh, encourage you to start. <laughs> sure. No, I, and, and actually, I'm looking at the, the Q and A. Kyle Smith asked a question about um, Orb Orb Book, uh, British Columbia. You know, that's that's a great example. I'm gonna, t you know, John John Jordan and team in Canada, you know, have done a great job of really rethinking the whole notion of. Um, you know, of, of the whole, you know, governmental processes around setting, you know, setting up new businesses and under, you know, and, and that, that um, you know, that structure of incorporation, et cetera. Um, I don't know it deeply enough to go into the details, but I know it's pretty, it's, you know, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty great use case and, and some, and some great work. And Jordan's obviously been, um, you know, incredibly active in our community um, and team. So, um, you know, I'd certainly answer that question with a, um, you know, that, <laughs> I think that's a great example. Um, you know, I talked earlier around about Nippon Express, maybe, um, you know, one of, one of my favorites um, that we're working on uh, is with the, you know, is the, is the partnership with the World Economic Forum on the Known Traveler Digital Identity Program. It's a, you know, it's a work with Canada and the Netherlands, the countries of Canada and Netherlands, Schiphol Airport, Toronto Montreal Airport, KLM Airlines near Canada. Uh, and it's the whole, it's uh, applying Indy and the whole notion of self-managed identity to be able to facilitate in its first instance, the border crossing process. And, and the reason I like it, um, you know, uh, not with not notwithstanding, you know, the fact that we're not traveling very much right now, but the that notion of having that highest level agreement at a governmental level that this kind of verifiable credential is sufficient to be able to cross a border as as one of the more intense identity, you know, checking moments um, is is great unto itself. And then and when you know once it's out there, once it's everywhere, and it and we can just cruise through the uh, immigration and uh, border control process. That's great, but it's more the it's more also or it's also what can then gets built on top of that right so in the in the mix and the discussions are hotels and banks and you know and and other you know the entirety of our experiences the way this whole identity space is going to play out is going to be through islands of implementation where can where do we see different use cases where there's a valuable um a valuable context and drive for someone to get one of these digital identity wallets, start to populate it with credentials, use it valu valuably in one context, but because it's being built off of the same standards and the, and the whole topic of, you know, Chris referenced earlier, the importance of interoperability, right? If we have all of these islands developing against that same, same standard in, in an in, in, interoperable fashion, that's how we cross the chasm from what on the face of it would look like a gargantuan effort to say, let's redefine you know, digital identity for the world, right? It's, it's gonna be done in these very useful, you know, useful, valuable business case contexts on islands of implementation that'll get bridged between, you know, bridged together time, you know, over, over and over again. Um, so, you know, maybe I throw out, throw out that one. I talked about Nippon Express with um, fabric and supply chain. Um, you know, we we uh, did some early work with Sawtooth with the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. I think you know, put part part of who we are, right? We're we're not a we're not a um, uh, we're not a, a product or platform company. We're we're a services company. So we've you know we always value having that that hands-on direct engineering to engineering team access and experience with all of the leading platforms. And so we've we've tried you know we've I think we've used all <laughs> used all of the projects, if not all of them. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and have benefited and valued that experience and having the, the different, uh, different platforms for different contexts. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, we, you know, there's a long list. It's been, it's been a great ride applying these projects with our clients. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's kind of funny how, uh, you know, new technologies, they tend to be adopted by startups first and enterprises are kind of a laggard, like with, with cloud and other technologies. But in, from Hyperledger from day one, you know, with David's talking about governments, uh, Tay's stock exchange with blockchain technology partners on Sawtooth as well. Uh, and then CBDCs, right, central banks, uh, just five years in from, from you know, what was sort of POC you know, nuggets of technology back five years ago to being uh, actually live with uh, Project Back Hong out in Cambodia. So it was a, a great webinar a couple of days ago with Makoto from Soramitsu. Uh, so so uh, in Cambodia, they are actually live today with a uh, mobile app that anyone can use to transfer central bid central bank digital currencies, or we stumble on that one, uh, peer-to-peer basis. So. 
uh, I think for you know what was a you know five years seems like a long long time but you know we're not in startup land where you can build an MVP in six months and get it out there and iterate we're talking about core mission critical systems here uh, and to go from next to zero to live in production at a central bank uh, is is incredible. Um. Chris yeah, Bryant. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, you, you know, IBM's got a number of uh, projects. I think the most notable ones would be like the the food trust network that we partnered with Walmart and uh, Kroger and a, a a number of uh, Carrefour and others um, uh, that's in production. And it's you know it, we keep adding new foodstuffs to the to the network. I think the most recent one was. Uh, um, oh my God! <laughs> just olive oil, it. wasn't it? Olive oil. Olive oil. Thank you very much. I just I just tweeted it this morning. <laughs> um, was you know tracing the provenance of olive oil, which is actually one of the most contentious articles that you can find in the supermarket because a lot of it isn't really virgin. <laughs> Some of it's not even olive oil. So um, scary stuff. Um, uh, but uh, so the, the the food trust I think was uh, you know probably the. One of the first ones, and then also the uh, the Trade Lens initiative that IBM partnered with Maersk, um, that is uh, you know really sort of uh, growing up. These are in production, and they keep growing and adding new members, um, new ports of call, and so forth um, uh, to the network. <clears throat> and I think that you know again the the it's not so much a technology problem. The, you know the technology is production grade. I mean you know regardless of which project you're looking at, whether it's Besu or Fabric or or, or India or what have you, this is production grade technology, um, but it's the building of these networks, the developing the governance model for how are we going to agree on what's the chain code or what's the smart contract that we're going to, to use, you know, what, what means of uh, identity are we going to choose uh, to be able to confirm that, you know, we are who we say we are and so forth. Th that piece of the puzzle is the hardest part. Getting in many cases, uh, you know, fierce competitors to collaborate with one another in developing one of these networks is is sometimes the hardest uh, the hardest part. And uh, so so that work on goes. But I mean, we have I think we, we as I mentioned, we've come up with a number of different sort of patterns that really work effectively. So you think about what Trade Lens is. It's about moving shipping documents from one port of call to the other um, uh, and ensuring that nothing has changed, so we can check the. Uh, that everything that's in the shipping containers is what was was shipped from the other port. Um, that's really a document management problem, right? And and so it so what other applications that's really about document management can you apply with essentially the same pattern of you know uh, putting it and recording the, the the document on the blockchain and being able to verify it uh, on in in a different context. So you know again I think I think what we're seeing is uh, you know increasingly taking those patterns and applying them in different contexts. So su supply chain uh, management and you know, know your supplier kind of a thing is, is now another uh, one of those patterns, one of those solutions. We, I think it's, uh, IBM calls it a trusted supplier, right? Um, and so it's, it's really about understanding who is in your supply chain and are you dealing with uh, you know, a trusted supplier or provider of, of your goods? So, um, you know, I, I think, again, it's not so much, you know, are, do we see these things in production? Yes, we do. I think, you know, the, the real challenge going forward, as David said, is how do you sort of pull these things together? And that's, that oftentimes is the hardest part. It's not a technology problem. And in fact, you know, I, we, I like to say, you know, sort of blockchain is uh, typically about 20% of the solution. And David knows this very well. Most of it is the integration of the blockchain into all the stuff that you already have or, or the new stuff that you're building. And, and that's the the challenge, the most challenging aspect of any of these projects. That, that is the, that's the, there's a funny moment, right? In any one of these big transformation programs, right? You have a big, you have a big, big room full of, of you know, of, of stakeholders and some engineer from, you know, some architect from the back of the room will be, you know, raise their hand as you're putting up the whole reference architecture. It's like, I thought this was a blockchain project. You'd be like, yeah, it's this corner down here of the, of the architecture diagram. You're still gonna build everything else. <laughs> like it's gonna, you know, to do something real. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, and, and I, maybe just, just one last thought, and I, the, the, um, if, if I pull on, right, what, what Dan and Chris and I all, all shared, I think one of the, I think one of the most special and valuable things has been how these projects 
have been, you know, have been, have really been, I think, facilitated or even originated or have emerged from the, from the very collaborative open community of, of, you know, that the, within the Hyperledger family, right, that the, you know, at our events, at the dialogue, uh, you know, the dialogues we have in the hallways and, and the like, um, uh, you know, a number of projects that we've been involved in have germinated that way um, and have involved multiple Hyperledger family members. Uh, and that I think that's you know is a testament to both the culture that we've 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 been able to build, but also you know the inherent the inherent characteristics of this particular wave of innovation that require that. Um, and so, um, looking forward to the family continuing to grow and thrive. Well, and um, one project that's um, already in production that I could mention from um, our experience uh, was a team at Intellecti Use that uh, were built in partnership with a financial institution and uh, local Belgian governments, like city governments, is um, on the loyalty side and um, incentivizing behavior, like whether it's recycling or taking your bike instead of a car uh, to take kids to school or for them to go to school. So um, I definitely uh, feel that there is significantly more project out there. And I completely agree uh, with you, David, that, uh, you know, also like governance is a big question, like and willingness uh, to um, willingness to implement and change all those business models and um, uh, very often you know blockchain is only like five percent and not even you know a challenge you can just implement it but um, building everything else around it it's really important five percent but <laughs> <laughs> right 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 it's nothing that unlocks the rest of it but Right, but then it's like that um, total um, snow snowball effect, right? <laughs> of everything right. else that needs to change yeah. for, for those five percent to come into play. So we have a few minutes left, and um, I would really love to hear your thoughts and predictions for the future. Like, what are the next five years of Hyperledger going to look like? Who would like to start? I, I'm I'm happy to kick it off. We um um. And maybe, maybe in a wider context, right? I, I think the um, if you look if you look at our membership roster and the other related important communities that have joined and been part of this, um, you know, and and even across the Linux family, right? The you know the the other Linux projects that you know that that relate, um, you know, that relate to this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking Finos. I'm thinking, you know, you know, you know, et cetera. I I think the whole notion in the next period is going to be um, you know, the, the killer use case is really scaling in production. Um, and, and, you know, and, and we've talked about a number of them here, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, supply chain, digital identity, financial infrastructure, central bank, digital currency, you know, et cetera. Um, the, the, you know, the dialogues there have, have shifted so that they're about the use case and the value case. And, oh, by the way, they're underpinned by blockchain, right? <laughs> is the, you know, um, and, and it'll, and, and when we do our jobs right, in the in the public domain, you don't really know, right? Um, or the end users don't really know um, that there's this you know phenomenal capability behind it. Um, and I think we're gonna have to wrestle with that dynamic, right? As we move forward, um, to you know, because it's not it, we're not leading with the technology, we're leading with the the valuable use cases now out in the market. So our ability, I think, to to um, continue to support that with that with the foundation layer of of you know of capability. Um, is obviously crucial, um, and our ability to to tie tie in directly to that to that value and outcome basis, and continue to expand the ability to convene, right? The public private partnerships, the convening capability to rally around that, to give the feedback loop to the developer and architect community around what's really useful and helpful, and you know propels those use cases forward. Um, that's how we'll win. <laughs> Um, you know, or, 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 you know, wins probably the wrong term. Um, that's, you know, that's how we'll thrive and, and grow and, you know, and see this technology really take root. Um, the, the other interesting dynamic to that is the, is the, um, I give a lot of thought to this. I meet, you know, I spend a lot of time in the startup community and their, their entry point into the infrastructure that they build assumes these things. Right, as they, you know, they're born in the cloud. They're born, in, you know, born in the construct of tokenization and you know, rethinking identity and and the like. And it's the, you know, it's the, you know, it's the modernization of existing corporate enterprise government structures. That's, you know, that that is, uh, you know, is a huge, you know, is the huge coal face that we have to continue to to hack away at. 
um, you know, our engagement in both of those communities create some interesting dynamics where, you know, the, the new entrants may, you know, will race ahead and will grow fast as, as happens in the, in this digital era and the degree to which, you know, the existing, you know, existing players can modernize quickly. Um, that dynamic, I think is also going to be important for us as we think, 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 think ahead around building really useful, um, engaging capabilities. All right, we're pretty much out of time, but um, oh, sorry. Maybe maybe we could um, yeah maybe everybody else and I see there's also a question about Damol came in so then maybe you have some finishing words and Brian Chris would love to hear from you as well. Nothing better to finish on than a suspiciously anonymous question to give me a plug. So thank you to whoever that was. <laughs> Um, just to tie it into that last question uh, super quickly, I think, you know, going forward, we're going to continue to see the componentization that, that Chris and Brian mentioned earlier, both within Hyperledger with uh, pulling our projects to become more modular and be able to integrate with each of those. And uh, from the customer point of view, being able to pick, you know, the sort of best of breed for each different layer of the stack. And back when we started, we didn't even know where those boundaries were for each of those modules, let alone how to define those, those interfaces. Uh, but right now we're starting to see you know, that modularization within Hyperledger and as well as uh, external integrations that you know, David mentioned, potentially with projects in Finos, uh, with DAML, which is an open source smart contract language created by Digital Asset. Uh, we've integrated that with Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Sawtooth and Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, I know there's integrations with, with other projects external to, to Hyperledger as well. So, the more componentization and modularization we get, I think, we'll, the more we'll start to uh, look less like a monolithic competition between Hyperledger Fabric or Ethereum or the, you know, Corda, uh, and more of a, you know, like most traditional software stacks in production today, uh, companies focusing on, on different elements of that stack and giving a, an overall better experience to, to customers and, and accelerating the production journey. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're at the end of the line here uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I think, you know, there are a number of use cases, for instance, that we wouldn't dream of trying to go to market with today, simply because the volume of uh, transactions that it would need to support is just we're just not there, right? You know, uh, I'm thinking of <clears throat> I met with uh, the team from Visa and. You know, it used to be that the, the saying was, oh, they do 25,000 transactions a second. That was actually their benchmark for their testing. Uh, and uh, the gentleman in the back of the room when I was doing a briefing there was that, no, that's my job. And it's actually 75,000 transactions a second sustained over a period of at least two hours. That's their benchmark for what they have to be able to deliver. We're not even close to that, right? We're in the couple of thousand, 3,000, you know, maybe, maybe up to five. Um, but we're certainly not in the in that particular realm, and and that's just the Visa network. And you think about all these things interconnected. Oh my God, you know it just gets a little bit nutty. And so I think much like the sort of the data and AI space, I think there will be you know continued innovation, continue looking at different approaches, whether it's to consensus, you know, whether it's to you know smart contracts with you know modules like Daml and so forth. Um, simplifying the approach of how do you write these smart contracts? And and Demo goes a long ways towards that. Um, but again, I think with the, as with data and AI, we're just going to continue to see more and more innovation to make it easier for people to in integrate blockchain into their solutions um, and for us to interconnect these things. Uh, and, but that's going to take a continued, you know, focus on improving performance and throughput and scale and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, so, you know, we have we have a ton of work ahead of us. And then I think there's the all the different, uh, 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 you know, Brian, I need you know, to sort of plug some of the things that you're doing is sort of building some of these sort of uh, focused network based uh, communities on the, the side or sort of around Hyperledger. They're not formally part of it, but I would hope that we would see some interconnective tissue building between these various organizations so that we're getting you know, feedback and input from the communities that are trying to use the technology to figure out where do we need to go with it. Uh, Brian, I'll leave the last word to you. For sure, all of all of what's been said so far. Um, you know, I, my personal goal is to see Hyperledger set up not as a, a five or ten year type of open source project, but but a forty or fifty year one. Um, uh, the Linux kernel is uh, next year will turn thirty years old. TCP/IP as a standard is. 
gosh, it's probably 50 years old at this point. Um, I, I forget exactly when the, the, the first kind of packet started flying, but I believe it was the early 70s, um, uh, if not late 60s. So blockchain technology for industries as a whole to be able to trust it and be able to move core processes to it, they've got to know that it's going to be there tomorrow, in a year, in 10 years. You know, we don't have to talk about the legacy mainframe still running in some places to know that technology cycles in, in what we're proposing are incredibly long and we have to be here for the long term. Uh, and so that's what uh, we've been, I, I hope, establishing a culture and an infrastructure around uh, and, and, you know, that individual pieces will evolve over time. Uh, but we've got to be here for the long term and have a solid foundation for that. And then I do sincerely hope that uh, we can per start to permeate other Linux Foundation projects, spin up new ones that, that, that connect very closely, that serve as feeders for new code in the Hyperledger, but also help tackle some of these adjacent uh, uh, challenges in domain specific ways. Uh, that uh, um, that blockchain is really well suited to try to tackle. So uh, I'm incredibly optimistic. Optimistic. I don't get a lot of sleep these days, only because there's so much that we have to do on all these fronts. Uh, and it's been an incredibly uh, a rewarding honor to be a, a part of the Hyperledger community. So thank all of you on the rest of the panel for um, uh, giving me a chance to be your executive director. Thank you, uh, Hannah, for uh, leading this panel in our conversation and, and telling us more about uh, what Intellect EU has, been, has done in this space, which is re really good to hear. Um, and join us next week uh, for, um, it'll be at a at more of an Asia Pacific friendly time. So join us if you can, um, uh, but uh, we'll continue the conversation there and, uh, and, and look for the next few over the next uh, five weeks and see you all at the next one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll wrap up here. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.